Grace and peace to one and all. I am Sister Karima Paris of the Thusia Seventh-day Adventist Church, welcoming you to our Bible study as we begin a new pillar in our systematic theology. This pillar is pillar number four, where we will be covering prevenient grace or the calling. But before we do so, let us please bow for a word of prayer. Dear Gracious Father, please have mercy upon me now through your Holy Spirit, through you granting me your Holy Spirit, dear Father, that I may show to the people your divine nature of love for them to understand your great love towards us. In Jesus' holy name, Amen. Yes, my dear brethren, friends, family, thank you again for joining me in our Bible study as we continue to investigate this book, look into this book, Systematic Theology. Yes, The Seven Pillars of the Plan of Salvation, written by Brother Nairon Medina of the Thusia Seventh-day Adventist Church. We will be beginning pillar number four today by God's grace. And in looking at pillar number four, we will be investigating the first edition of this book, which was written in 1986. But before we go into that portion of truth, let us remind you of what we would have seen before as we consider this second point of grace that shows us the love of God towards us. This is what we would have seen before. In understanding and seeing the depravity of man, what did God do? God initiated his plan of salvation, which is the whole atonement, the whole grace, of God to save depraved man away from sin. Under this plan of salvation or in this plan of salvation, the whole atonement, the whole grace of God, we have providential grace, we have prevenient grace, we have renewing grace, we have imparted grace, and we have judicial grace. Those are the five points of grace in the whole plan of salvation. And we would have covered, we would have covered providential grace, where we saw that under providential grace, which is God's giving of his only son, he is the provider, he provided Christ. His incarnation, his sin-free life, his sacrificial crucifixion, his resurrection, and his anointing as high priest. So as our high priest in heaven, what Jesus is doing now, he is administering graces unto us. And the first point of grace that is applied to us since providential grace is just a provision, the provision of the merits of Jesus Christ, what God does is he applies those merits to human beings, to mankind. And the first application the first application of the merits of Jesus comes through prevenient grace or the calling. You see, my dear friends, my dear brethren, my dear family, man we know is depraved, born void of God, even as we looked at the depravity of man. So, he has the carnal mind in him. The man who has the carnal mind, 
He does not seek after God. He does not know God. He's not interested in knowing God. All things except God he seeks. But God, in his great love and his great mercy towards mankind, chooses to call man unto him. And that is what prevenient grace is all about. Prevenient grace is about the calling of man, the calling of the sinner to God. And that is his love. And you would be amazed as we look at it, as to the, what God does to help man to see that he is love, to help man to see that he is righteousness, to help man to see that he is concerned about him and he wants him to be saved. So my dear friends, what are we going to do? By God's grace, we'll be reading from the first edition of our systematic theology that was written in 1986. And then we will continue looking at prevenient grace under the second edition by God's grace from next week. So we are touching the second grace, the second point of grace, which is prevenient grace today. And this is what we are told by Brother Nairon Medina and I quote, The value of the second point of grace in the five points of grace can never be underestimated without punity or without a cost. This great truth of prevenient grace, discovered in its primitive form by John Wesley, has now been given to us by God in its developed form, showing its six parts, two of which are man's response. Now, in the first edition, you will see that Brother Medina has two of which is man's response. But as the truths develop, as God reveals himself more and more to us, he shows us that it is actually three parts. And I could tell you them now. Man has to repent, man has to believe, and man has to confess. But in this edition, he tells us about repentance and believing as the appropriate response to the calling. Now let us continue reading and I quote, The necessity of prevenient grace is that it is the only true condition of justification. Listen to that. It is the only true condition of justification. If renewal is to occur in the man, it must first be preceded by a calling. So if renewal, if justification has to take place in the man, it must be preceded by a calling from God, in which the man responds, thus prevenient grace is sinner. So let me say something about this. When we looked at providential grace, which comes before prevenient grace, we saw that providential grace was monogistic, meaning it is God alone who had provided. Man has no part to play in it. As Abraham told Isaac, God will provide himself. A lamb. So under providential grace, it was monogistic. But now, when it comes to prevenient grace, the second point of grace, what do we have? What do we understand? It is synergistic. God does the calling and man responds. So from that, from that very point or thought, that God gives the calling and man responds shows that we have to we have to consent to his calling. 
we have to accept the calling of God. Except a man accept God's calling, he will not be saved. And so, in the love of God, what does he do? He calls us so that we could see him as love. What else we are told? And I quote from Brother Nairon Medina again, he says, Prevenient grace is the grace of God placed into our hearts for conviction before we are converted. And this exercise of God's own initiative must be reacted to by the appropriate human response of repentance, of believing, if we are to be justified and also confess. He has to confess that the will of God is right. The truth of God is right. God's way is right. So what are we told here? We are told that prevenient grace is the grace of God placed in our hearts for conviction. So when you receive a conviction that something is wrong, what is that? That conviction that something is wrong, it is God's grace placed into your heart to bring conviction and that is before you are even converted. And so when you think about prevenient grace, you think and you consider and you see the great love of God to man in that he puts grace into the heart of man for him to be convicted. And so that man, when he does the right thing, have the right or appropriate response, he can be saved, he can be justified, he can be changed, he can be converted, he could come into another man. But before any change could take place, God must call you. So when you hear his voice, the Bible says you must not harden your heart. When you get conviction that something is wrong, your way is wrong, that is God's action towards you. In him, placing into your heart his grace to convict you that you are wrong of sin, the Bible says. So man must have the appropriate response that is a response of repentance, believing, and also confessing if he is to be justified or changed. So let me quote Brother Nairon Medina again. And when I quote him, I want you to think. I want you to listen and I want you to think about God's ways. And what you would be seeing coming out of it is how God is love and how he is so merciful towards us. Let me read now what Brother Medina has said. In this exercise, God must first temporarily remove the carnal mind of man at which for a brief while the man has nihilation. What is nihilation? So God temporarily removes the carnal mind. You see, the carnal mind is the mind that is enmity against God. The carnal mind is the mind, the fleshly mind, that does not obey God. It is not subject to the law of God, neither indeed can be. That carnal mind, God must temporarily remove that carnal mind for a brief moment and cause the man to experience something called nihilation, where the man has no holy values or no carnal values. So in that portion, that period, where God temporarily removed the carnal mind, in that period where the man the carnal mind is temporarily removed, nihilation occurs. The man has no values. He does not have any holy values. He doesn't have any carnal or sinful values. Look at what God does after that process of nihilation. I call it a process. But it happens so fast that some, it is not recognized. But this is what God does in 
prevenient grace. So when God temporarily puts the man in the experience of nihilation by removing the carnal mind, causing the man to have no values for holy things and no values for uh, carnal things, what happens? Then God, by the placing of faith, must temporarily place the divine mind into the man. So look at this wonderful science. In order for you to be called, what does God do? God temporarily takes away the carnal mind, puts you into an experience of nihilation where you have no values for holy, holiness, no values for carnal things. And in that moment, what God does, he places faith into the mind so that man must temporarily have the divine mind. Let me read it the way how Brother Medina has it. Then God, by the placing of faith, must temporarily place the divine mind, end of quote, into the man. You see how wonderful God is? How merciful and how loving he is to us that he wants us to be saved and this process of nihilation where he temporarily takes away the carnal mind and temporarily give the divine mind he must temporarily take away the carnal mind because if he has to place faith in the mind that you may have the divine mind if you are to have the divine mind and the carnal mind together you will be destroyed and so the very whole process of God giving you the experience of nihilation by temporarily taking away the carnal mind demonstrates that he loves you and he does not want you to be destroyed. That is what it shows. His marvelous, rich love that nobody can love like that. What else are we told here in our reading? from? Systematic Theology, the 1986 edition. What else are we told? So we see what God does. This is what Brother Medina says, and I quote, By the temporary placing of the divine mind in the man, this brings conviction of sin and righteousness. Isn't that wonderful? God wants you to be saved. And in his process of calling, he must take away the carnal mind temporarily and he must give you the divine mind. And in that process of, of time or that span of time, which is so short, to bring conviction to you, that is what he does. He places the divine mind into the man to bring conviction of sin and of righteousness. You see the marvelous work that God does to save a man? The calling is very important. Look at what God does in his exercise of love, if I could put it like that, or his behavior of love to call man so that man could see righteousness. So that man could get conviction of sin and righteousness that takes place in our mind. What else are we told by Brother Medina? This is what is said. At the moment, the man now sees God to be love and sin to be evil. And as he looks a little longer, to see the pleasures of love, he slowly begins to develop an appreciation for it. <laughs> so, my dear friends and brethren, think upon this. When God puts the spiritual mind into you temporarily to bring convictions of sin and righteousness, in that moment, the man sees God to be love and sin to be evil. So when you see something is wrong with sin, whatever sin it is that you might have practiced, when you come to see and behold something is wrong with that, 
It is God's working upon your mind to cause you to see him as love. So you see God as love and the sin you see as evil. And if you continue to think upon it, to look upon it a little longer, what do you see? You see the pleasures of love and slowly begin to develop an, ap an appetite for it. That is wonderful. So when you start getting a, an appetite for holy things and spiritual things, it is because God is working on you. God is working on you to save you away from your sins. That is what he's doing. So let us see further what Brother Medina explains here to us. Let us see a little further about this wonderful truth concerning prevenient grace or the calling. So at this time, when the man develops appetite, as he sees the pleasure of love, at that time, if he repents, which is rejecting the carnal mind as not love, and he rejects its rulership in his soul, and believes or accepts as truth the reign in his soul and existence, the divine mind, God crucifies the carnal mind, which is non imputing it to the man, and imputes the divine mind of righteousness to the man, and at that moment, he is justified. So my dear friends, what are we told? Look at this wonderful working of God in the calling. So you get conviction of sin, righteousness, and judgment. You repent, which is the rejection of the carnal mind, seeing it not to be love anymore. And you reject the rulership of the carnal mind over you. And you believe and you accept the truth to reign in your soul. So instead of the, the error, the values of sin, what you now accept to reign in your soul as you repent and believe is the truth. And the truth now reigns in your soul, in your mind and govern you. So as truth, as you accept the truth to reign in your soul and the existence of the divine mind, you have it because you want it or you want it, you believe it, God crucifies or he puts to death the carnal mind which is non-imputing it to the man. So he doesn't count it as yours anymore. God doesn't count the carnal mind as yours anymore because you rejected its rulership. You didn't, you stopped seeing it as love. And now you see the truth which has God in it as love. You accept the divine mind. You want the divine mind. You want love. You want God in place of the, the values for sin. God now does his action. You see, because before you can experience renewing or justification of life you must be called you must be called and you must uh you must have the right response to the calling and when you have the right response to the calling god non imputes the carnal mind or he crucifies the carnal mind and in crucifying the carnal mind he now imputes the divine mind of righteousness to the man and at that moment he is justified so to be justified is where god non imputes the carnal mind he kills it he crucifies it and he gives you in place of the carnal mind the spiritual mind as yours as a gift because that is what you want unfortunately this is what we are told and it is a reality not all men will repent and believe though there is no reason for this the cause of their turning away is the reconsidering of self as love you see the carnal mind is the carnal mind of self what self wants it is the thoughts of the flesh and so when a person do not repent 
when he does not accept the calling is because he, he reasons again and he considers again the values of the flesh as love. He values himself again as love and he rejects true love. So he rejects true love because he considers self to be love, the carnal mind with its values as love. He accepts that again in place of love, the love of the divine mind of God. That is what happens when a person turns away. They reject the true love who is God himself, the divine nature, the divine mind, and they accept back the carnal mind with its sinful values. Let us continue to see what Brother Medina has to say under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit concerning the calling. We are told. He says, it is of much necessity that God temporarily removes the carnal mind and that nihilation comes before the temporary placing of the divine mind. Remember we learned that nihilation is the, pro is the period in which the man has no values for the holy, holiness or holy things and no values. So he doesn't have holy values. He doesn't have carnal values. So it is of much necessity that God temporarily removes the carnal mind and that nihilation comes before the temporary placing of the divine mind. For if the divinity of God were to meet the carnal mind in the, in the man's mind, the glory of this righteousness that consumes sin will consume that man that has the sin in him. So you see, my dear friends, you see, when you think about this, what you're seeing, my dear brethren, it's nothing more than the love of God towards man. The process of nihilation is to save you too from destruction, from being consumed because sin is in you. And if God, the divine nature through the divine mind have to come and dwell in you when sin is in you, the Bible shows that you will be consumed because sin is in you. Let us look at some scriptures here. Let us look at at least these three scriptures that tells us, that shows us that if sin has to meet the glory of God or the righteousness of God together in your mind, it is destruction for you. You will be consumed so this is the love of god to give you the experience of nihilation do not overlook the very fact that god is calling you and in his calling you he exercises his love towards you by even giving you nihilation where you have no holy values and you have no values for carnal you don't have any carnal values and he he temporarily removes that carnal mind so that you wouldn't be consumed. Let us see Zechariah. In the book of Zechariah, as we consider verse four, chapter 14 and verse 12, this is what we are told here. And this shall be the plague wherewith Yahweh will smite all the people that have fought against Jerusalem. Their flesh shall consume away while they stand on their feet and their eyes shall be consumed away in their holes and their tongue shall be consumed away in their mouth. So when, let me share with you this chart here so that you could see this illustration. So we are talking about a person who is in sin. A person who is in sin, they would be destroyed by God. And we are told that what will happen to him in the illustration, you are seeing his eyes being consumed away, his flesh being consumed away, his tongue being consumed. 
And this is because if the glory of the righteousness of God meets the mind of sin, what God does is consumes it. And so to preserve you, to protect you from destruction, to call you, to save you, to call you unto him so that you could be justified where he kills the carnal mind or crucifies it. In order for God to do that so that mankind will not be consumed away, he puts us through what is called nihilation. And that is the great love of God towards us. So that we will have the chance to consent in, to believe in, to repentance, to confession, to be justified where he non-imputes the carnal mind to us and imputes the spiritual mind. So the illustration there is to show us that the eyes of our socket will be consumed away. Our tongues would be consumed away and our flesh will be consumed away if righteousness, if God has to meet idol values in the mind. Because the idol values in the mind exalts creation as God with God. And God hates that sin. He hates sin. Good and evil doesn't go together. You cannot have the divine mind and you cannot have the carnal mind together. You're either carnally minded or you're spiritually minded. And if you have the carnal mind and God is calling you, he must temporarily remove the carnal mind and give you temporarily the divine mind. If that nihilation, if that process does not take place, the Bible shows that since God is a consuming fire, which we would see in Hebrews, since God is a consuming fire, you will be destroyed if righteousness has to meet sin in you. That is why we cannot be saved in sinning. That is why we cannot be saved in sinning. This is what we are told in Hebrews chapter 12 and verse 29. It tells us this, my dear friends. For God is a consuming fire. Did you hear that? God is a consuming fire and he will consume sin. Consume sin to destroy sin. And so in his great love and in his great mercy, he temporarily removes the carnal mind and that nihilation comes in play before the temporary placing of the divine mind so that we will not be consumed. The sin will not be consuming us, which will mean that we will be consumed as well. Now let us look and let us go further as we come to a close in our discussion here. And I hope my aim in showing this to us, my hope in showing this to us is for you to consider, is for you to consider the great love of God towards us, his divine nature. He is the divine nature of love. This is what we are told. The Bible tells us that God is love. That is his nature. He is love. And the very calling of God and the operations that takes place for us to be called demonstrates the fact that God is love and he doesn't want us to be destroyed. And that is why he's calling us. This is what, what we are told further by Brother Nairon Medina. The temporary existence of the divine mind in the mind does not make the man righteous at that time. So when God temporarily gives you the divine mind, in your mind, it is temporarily, temporary. It does not make you righteous. Why? I quote from Brother Medina. Because it is only when he, the man, repents and believes and God imputes this mind to that man that he is subjectively 
made righteous because justification is by imputation and not by infusion so god imputes the divine mind onto you he conks to impute is to conk it is from the greek word logizomai which he conks it as yours he adds it as yours he esteems it as yours and he gives it to you it's an estimation that makes it is an estimation that gives when you think about god giving of the this divine mind when you repent god esteems it as yours and when he esteems it as yours it is yours by his estimation his counting it as yours that is what it is and so the man when he is given temporarily the divine mind he is not made righteous he is just put under the experience for him to receive conviction of the love of god and of sin this is what we are told the catholic church believes that justification is by infusion but justification is by imputation this is what we are told further by brother medina the temporary absence of the carnal mind from in the man does not purge him from that defilement for it is only when the man repents and believes that god does not impute the sin unto the man purging him so the man must repent to be purged the man must repent for god to non impute the sin of the idol values of the carnal mind the man must repent for god to impute the divine mind this action of nihilation is just temporary and so god must after the man decides that he wants to experience love god will non impute the sin unto him and god will purge him causing him to experience justification which is the next point of grace after prevenient grace so prevenient grace is very important because before you can be justified or converted before you could receive the born of god experience you must be called no man can come unto god by himself man has no appetite for god it is god that must first call man and man must respond end of quote so what have we learned what have we learned my dear brethren and friends let me share with you this chat on the prevenient grace god is the one who does the calling and what are we seeing in this what is done by god by god's initiative is that he temporarily removes the carnal mind so there's a temporary removal of the carnal mind there is nihilation taking place where the man have no values of holiness and he have no values for anything that is carnal or fleshly what else are we told done by god's initiative in him calling us under prevenient grace there is a temporary placing of the divine mind in the man and there is conviction given to the man of sin and of righteousness this is done by god's initiative what does man have to do on the prevenient grace showing that is synergistic repentance is done by man believing is done by man and confession is done by man then he could experience being justified 
this process of temporarily removing the carnal mind does not make the man righteous. The temporary placing of the divine mind does not make the man purged. The man must repent, believe, and confess concerning the truths of God. Prevenient grace is God's calling, God's calling to man so that man could receive justification of life. My dear friends and brethren, thank you very much for joining this study. My aim and my hope in presenting this portion of prevenient grace to you was with the intention of you seeing the love of God towards you, towards mankind. That God will take the time to call us unto himself. We are told in the book of Hebrews, when you hear his voice, which is his calling, harden not your heart. In other words, consent to him. Consent to be ruled and reigned by him, by rejecting the carnal mind. We come to an end. Let us pray. Dear loving Father which art in heaven, thank you dear God for showing us your divine nature of love to call us unto yourself. Thank you for showing us what you do in our minds so that we wouldn't be consumed away because thou art a consuming fire. Whereby, through your great mercy and love, you temporarily remove the carnal mind, put us in a state of nihilation where we have no holy values and no carnal values. And you temporarily place the divine mind in us so that we could have conviction of sin and of righteousness. So that we could repent. I pray dear Father that you will continue to show unto us your great love, your self-denying love to save us away from our sins. In Jesus holy name I pray these things. Amen.